quick brown fox jump over the lazy dog. It's where we all begin. Welcome to Lazy Dog Typewriters. Radio Free Europe was an institution of the Cold War aimed quite literally at the communist dictatorships behind the Iron Curtain. Radio Free Europe broadcasts news and information into the heart of the Soviet Empire, whose people were yearning for freedom and secret listening. Communist governments frequently sent agents to infiltrate its headquarters, and the KGB jammed its signals. Still, Radio Free Europe was a radio beacon of hope and helped produce the cracks in the Iron Curtain that led Hungary to open its border with Austria in the summer of 1989. Hungary's actions started the flow of refugees that led to the collapse of the Soviet Empire and the fall of the Berlin Wall later that year. We have a lot to thank the Hungarians for. Hermes in the ancient Greek mythology, is the messenger of gods, spreading news from Mount Olympus. It also happens to be the name of a fine Swiss manufacturer of typewriters. What's the connection? Hermes began producing typewriters like this one in Hungary in the 1970s. Goulash, paprika, and freedom make a great tasting dish. Let's learn more. Howdy folks, and welcome to Lazy Dog Typewriters where you see in front of you a Hungarian Hermes 3000. And you might think, well, why is it a Hungarian Hermes 3000? And of course, it's because it has a landscape of Budapest's famous landmarks on the top of it, starting with the Parliament Building, the bridge across the Danube, uh, the Heroes Square, and what's probably St. Matthias' Church on top. Having been there, I can say it doesn't exactly look like that, but what are you going to do? So gaze in the landmarks of Hungary and Budapest while you look at this very angular, very distinctive Hungarian Hermes 3000 typewriter. We'll complete our circuit and then we'll dive into greater detail of this wonderful typing machine. Okay, so the Hermes 3000 has become one of the most sought after machines on the manual typewriter market. And that is, of course, due to the patron saint of typewriters in the celebrity sphere, Tom Hanks, having praised the Hermes 3000 with the words that there is none, none finer. You'll find no finer typewriter than the Hermes 3000. And I think that's certainly something that could be argued. I think the Olympia SM9 and the Adler J5 definitely occupy the same space in the typo sphere, if you will, as the Hermes 3000. So uh, we can battle to the death over which exact one is the best. But then, what about all the different kinds of Hermes 3000? In fact, this Hermes 3000 has a plastic body and an angular uh, design aesthetic. So some would say it's the least attractive of the Hermes 3000, the least desirable. And I don't know what to say about that, other than the fact that I happen to have a total of three Hermes 3000s, uh, not uh, 2,997 short of the desired note, I guess. But I particularly like this machine, not to spoil the review, but I particularly like this machine. And I guess that's because I am not a purist when it comes to plastic. A plastic frame does not bother me. Uh, and I don't particularly mind angular designs, especially when they're so emblematic of the time period from which they were created. And that takes us a little bit of the way back to step into our discussion that Kevin gave us of Radio Free Europe and Hungary, the collapse of the Soviet Union, all these factors leading together. And so I'll segue into that a little bit. Hungary, uh, of course, was formerly part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and that was utterly destroyed by World War I. Uh, it's not good to lose a world war, as many countries can attest, but it was particularly not good to lose World War I because the conquering powers were much less merciful than those who won World War II. And one of the things that they did was, uh, since the uh, Serbians had been supported by the Austro-Hungarians and uh, the Allied powers and the Axis powers, or the Entente, excuse me, Triple Entente, Axis comes later, 
um, they decided they would break up Hungary and Austria. So it was split in half in 1920 or 22. There was a treaty signed, and it was one of those treaties at the point of a barrel of a gun. And they decided, okay, we'll split. And so then the Hungarians were severed from the Austrians and uh, were fully independent. It looks like they'll remain that way. Uh, but they definitely had a distinct European, Central European aesthetic going on and uh, connection um, that sort of set them up, I think, maybe 50, 60, 70 years later when the cracks in the European Soviet Empire were starting to form. The Hungarians were the ones who really got the ball rolling by opening their border up with Austria and allowing those refugees yearning to breathe free the ability to escape. And I'm not certain that Hermes 3000 had anything to do with it, although Hermes definitely is a messenger of the gods, and maybe they got the message, thanks to Radio Free Europe, about what opportunities were available in the West. But it's all connected, sort of like our connections with Richard James Burke video we did before. So it's an interesting thing to keep in the background. Hermes is a creation of its time period, of the mid to 1970s, before Glasnost, before the opening, Perestroika, all those terms that many of you are now learning about in history, and I had the privilege of living through, um, had happened. And what was going on was uh, Hermes was just trying to save a buck. And they tried to produce the Hermes 3000 typewriter in Hungary to save money because it was cheaper. And the Hungarians had uh, excellent manufacturing capabilities for a lot of products. And they decided to make them there. So they also, later on, Bulgarians made um, Keller and Nopich machines uh, by Typewriter International. That's sort of a related, a related but different uh, typewriter. Maybe we'll try to connect those dots for you in another video. But Hermes was making typewriters in Hungary to save money. They were making them out of plastic to save money, to expedite the speed of the processing of them. And this is what resulted from those efforts, from that zeitgeist, this period of time. You've got communist typewriter uh, workers making uh, engines of capitalism in the form of typewriters like this. All right, a lot of background. Let's look at what we've got here. So, for those of you familiar with the Hermes 3000, one of the first knocks against the earlier versions, although they are pretty and they are green, is that you couldn't make heads or tails of the cryptic symbols that were on the buttons on the top of the control panel. So let's look them out and see, look at these, and see if there has been an improvement. And I think that you will say that there is. So we have the backspace on the left, the tab set, tab clear, all clear, margin release, and tab. Couldn't be any simpler, okay? Now on the right, we have some very interesting things. This is the Hermes 3000, and we've got about 3,000 different colors on the line selector, which is what this is, not quite 3,000. But if we can see without the glare over here, we'll see we have our stencil position, we have a blue, we have a yellow, wait a minute, and then we have a red. So we've got four different positions, one, two, three and four. We'll talk about what that means in a minute. Over here on the left side of the ribbon cover, we have uh, selector and lever, one, two, three, and four. And that is your tension selector, one, two, three, and four. All right, other than that, we have a standard full-size keyboard with a dedicated one, shift lock. Uh, still have the uh, apostrophe over the eight, so we haven't shifted to the asterisk yet. We have a very large carriage return arm that's very easy to use and manipulate. It kind of folds down like this, pivots down for storage in the case. Our platen knobs. We have our margin release knobs, which are these white guys. And then we have our, sorry, I said margin release, carriage release knobs. Carriage release knobs here, and the margin release is here. Now that is what is one of the things that always trips me up on a Hermes 3000, and I think many others. And while you might have the opportunity to find one cheap, if you did because someone will hit this and it will zing the margin to whatever position that you're in and that will essentially lock the margin and it, uh, people think they're broken all the time. That leads me to say, let's take a look at the margin indicators themselves. I'm not sure how well this is coming out in the camera, but you see, yes, there we go. See this red line? It looks to me a lot like an old mercury thermometer and that shows you where your margin is set. And that is, again, controlled by that silver lever on the left and also on the right, which we will look at. But it tells you visually where your margin is. And it's a neat little ribbon that flows sort of in a complicated manner. There we go. We can see the edge of it. Flows through the paper bale itself. I mean, it's a crazy bit of uh, unnecessarily complex engineering <laughs> to produce a visual indication of where your margins are. But so be it. There it is. And woe betide the typewriter repairman who has to try to fig figure those out. I have not yet had to do it, but I don't want to if those get off. 
Continuing around to the back, here we have our paper support. And it's kind of an unusual thing itself. It only goes up halfway. It's uh, chromed, of course, and it works great. But you'd think, oh my gosh, it got smushed because it's bent. It doesn't go all the way up. Every other margin or paper support I've ever seen, I think, goes vertically. But this one is designed to go horizontally and keep the paper uh, not so vertical but more flat, which might actually be a little bit more uh, useful. All right, again, on the right-hand side panel, setting down our camera, this is what moves your carriage. This is what uh, <laughs> sets your margins somewhat surprisingly unexpectedly because this is what your thumb naturally or your finger naturally gravitates to when you're trying to move the carriage you think this is the carriage release i do i've done it a million times and every time i get a hermes i have to teach myself all right how do i move the carriage how do i set the margins and once you set those margins accidentally it can just throw everything through a loop of course your platen knob another observation these platen knobs uh, almost all the older hermes 3000 the 60s they all have broken knobs i think that the plastic that they use to create these knobs is much more resilient than the plastic from the lime green mental institution green more rounded and thus more desirable presumably hermes 3000 so another little pro for the 1970s angular hermes okay so what's this right here this is uh, just a nice uh, grip for your Paper bale, and you can see again some more of that complex engineering for the margin indicator. Our paper bale has some nice rollers, uh, card guides, etc. Let's go ahead and lift our ribbon cover off. All right, now we're looking under the hood, and one of the interesting things that I noticed, what do you notice when you look at this segment, Kevin? It looks kind of like a smile, and it looks sort of like a wave that a um, surfboarder would never want to um, catch because it dips down, and then it like flings them up in the air. All right, well, that is a lot. I was going to say it was a happy Hermes because it looks like it's smiling to me. It's unusual. It's an interesting design. Uh, maybe the Olympias are a little bit reminiscent of that, but uh, it's something pretty distinctive. And I wonder if you guys can comment below if you've seen other typewriters that have similar wavy uh, type bars or segments. Interesting. It takes a standard you know, Underwood Universal type spools. Um, here we have our uh, ribbon reverse mechanism. And here we have a ribbon vibrator. It's a segment shift, of course. And uh, here is where your serial number is going to be located on a little metal tab. We'll zoom in, you can see ours. Little metal tab here on the left of the machine, very easy to see. This is about 75, 76, as I recall. Um, and that's pretty much a quick and dirty of the machine. Um, it All right, let's give the typing touch a test. This round box jumps over the lazy ball. It's where we call again four four and seven years ago our fathers brought four on two oops on two this continent. Normally I don't type more than a line, partly because I'm such a poor typist, but when you have a machine that is as such a delight to type upon as is this Hermes 3000, you can uh, probably be surprised that it did not type out the entire Gettysburg address. I think uh, Typing Touch is a home run for this guy, and uh, it makes me like it so much that I'm going to go bring out a Hermes 3000 in the Kirby style and just give you a visual overview. Uh, because to me, the typing touch is the same, um, just as good. It might even be a hair firmer. I don't find, however, that the uh, tension selector touch control makes much difference. I have it in the four, but there's just a single little spring that pulls down on this that sets this. You can see it likes to want to jump all the way down. I don't think that really makes much difference. I don't feel it. But the keys are comfortable in your fingers. They're nicely spaced. These are pretty white, which I actually really like. Uh, there seems to be an inclination in my buttons. I'm not sure why. It doesn't have any impact. But um, as far as typing touch goes, uh, it's just a home run. It's great. It's wonderful. And let's compare it to a 1960s version. And continuing on, this Hermes 3000 from the 1960s. A 
little sticky. Forgive the typos, that's not the machine's fault. Uh, it does need a little bit of a lubrication uh, de uh, degreasing. This uh, has the coveted <laughs> Techno font, uh, as you can see, despite the typos. And this brings me up to my analysis of evaluating any machine's typing action. This one's a little sticky because it's a little dirty. I haven't cleaned it yet. But um, if anything, it's actually a little harder, uh, which is kind of hard to believe. And I think that's just due to the fact that this one is still dirty and this one has been cleaned. But both of them have wonderful typing action. You can even tell despite the, some of the gumminess of the segment of this guy. Uh, I would really have to say they're pretty much the same. And I think that makes sense because they have the same mechanicals. They have the same underlying equipment. And it would only make sense that uh, just the cosmetics are different. Um, I'm not, I guess they moved all the tooling, etc. when they moved to Hungary from Switzerland. But uh, the flyby here will show you. We have our Hermes 3000 in the curvy metal body style. And its successor, the Hermes 3000 from Hungary in the plastic body style. The 271, I believe they call the model. Both of them are really, really nice. Okay, just continuing on a few grab bag assortment ideas of differences. The carriage release, sorry, carriage return levers are almost identical, but they're not quite. The 3000 from the 60s it pivots just as the other one does, but it is a full circular rounded body. If I can get that up, you can take a look at that. It's a round tube. And on the 70s, in keeping with its angular style, you also have a more angular. Uh, hinge and more angular underside and see if I can lift that up for you to see underneath this particular machine you have a two channel a big wide square channel so that is also different and I think I showed in a still shot but you have a difference over here we have Swiss made Suisa uh, uh, stamped on the carriage rail and on the Hungarian there is nothing stamped at all uh, just very slight differences we notice the uh, tension selector is an arrow here and you have your four color dots which are of course mirrored white blue yellow and red on the 1970s that is a 1978 machine this is an early 60s model continuing with the cases not surprisingly the 1960s curvy model has a more curvy case this is the second variant of this case I have an original first six month edition which has a button here and a locking mechanism underneath which was defective <laughs> and so if you have one of those like I do that has never been modified it's actually kind of a time bomb that I'm afraid uh, might go off again and that is the little lock mechanism can freeze up and make it almost impossible to get the lid off one of the telltale signs that you have one of those other than the button here is that you'll see denting along the front panel where someone used a screwdriver to pry it off if it's anything like mine. In any case, the new this version of the case has a little lock here. Let's keep that unlocked. <laughs> and we have the latching mechanism is here on the right. You just lift it and you go. All right, so we'll take care of that. And now let's look at the 78 model. We have the more angular. You have your release button is here, slide up on the top. The same wire paper with a spring holding it in. Uh, that's pretty much identical. You've got some ribbing here for strength and support. The clips are up here to hold it in position. I'm not going to see if one will fit on the other because I'm pretty sure that it won't and I don't want to get it stuck. But it's a pretty close fit if you wanted to try it that way. And I think a nice looking case all around. All right, as to the pros and cons of the Hungarian Hermes 3000, this 1978 edition. The pros, we have a superb typing touch. Very wonderful to type on. I could type better almost than any other machine. Now, I am really torn between an Adler and an SM9 and a Hermes 3000. Um, 
I would probably go with the J uh, the the Adler J5, and that may get me burned at the heretical Hermes stake if necessary. But they're all so very close. It's all very personal preference, and maybe even down to individual machines. But I truly, uh, truly, really like the J5 as I do these. But it's a wonderful pro on this machine that the typing touch is so nice. It's soft. Some say buttery smooth. Um, it's just wonderful. The Hungarian edition uh, has clear labels. Backspace, tab set, tab clear, all clear for clearing all your tabs and margin release. Release, excuse me, and tab. And, and of course, the Hermes 3000 from the 60s has the same thing, but instead of being clearly labeled, you've got some cryptic plus and minus, which is not too hard, but then a three dashes, which nobody knows what that means, and then a double arrow, which is usually a margin release, but normally it's a double headed single arrow. So it can be a little confusing to not have clearly labeled keys. So, pro for the Hungarian Hermes. Uh, period correct styling. That's a way of saying, hey, this is the 1970s. I mean, look at these angles. Look at this cool star, which actually reminds me of the Bicentennial logo uh, from the US, but of course this is a Swiss Hungarian machine. Maybe it was a secret message for Radio Free Europe or from them, I don't know. Uh, but it's an angular design. I think it, it's appropriate. I like the white keys. I like the clear uh, lines that this has. I think it's a great machine. Cons. Well, easy one is it has a hard platen. I'm a little bit surprised because it's 1978. And again, those Adler J5s I love. I have one from 76 that I recently parted with. It had a wonderful soft platen. Uh, confusing margin controls. Uh, I think this is a hit on all the Hermes. I always want to grab right here. Uh, and uh, make that a carriage release, and it's not. It is a margin setting uh, key. And so that always uh, results in some magic margin myopia and migraines. Okay, cons. It's a plastic. Plastic fantastic. And if you don't like plastic, you are not going to like it, because guess what? It is made entirely of plastic, other than a few metal pieces. But all in all, the Hungarian Hermes 3000 is a worthy successor to the curvy Swiss Hermes 3000, one that I think is not overshadowed by its predecessors. And that just sort of leads me to conclude on our overall thoughts of liberty and independence and the debt of gratitude that we owe the Hungarians for opening up their borders, for resisting the foreign power of the Soviet Union at a dark time, it helped really change the course of the world. And the Hermes 3000 being made in Hungary didn't necessarily <laughs> cause those events to happen. But it's interesting to see the connections. Hungary was open and eager for foreign direct investment from Switzerland and probably West Germany as well. And that all contributed to uh, having more foreign currency, more exposure to the West, more thirst for freedom. And that is never a bad thing, and as Kevin said, goulash and good taste and paprika and freedom make a wonderful tasting dish, and this is a wonderful typing typewriter. Thanks so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next time. Calling out in the distance, calling out in the distance. Radio Free Europe, Radio Free Europe.